Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Lin, uh, and this is Accelerating Future. This is a podcast and a conversation about the future of organizations, whether they're startups, corporations, or even institutions like governments and universities themselves. And we'll be looking at ways that accelerator models and other models for innovation inside of the tech community in New York, but also all over the world, can produce a platform for creating new kinds of organizations that can educate and empower the workforce of tomorrow. So today, uh, we're very lucky to be with Dennis, uh, one of the founders and the CEO of X.AI, uh, which is a very well-recognized and well-known AI platform uh, inside of the New York City tech community. Uh, and we're going to be exploring how uh, his work at X.AI and the development of the company uh, are looking at their future, their challenges, and their opportunities in terms of building an emerging technology and a world-class uh, team of talent. So, uh, let's jump in. Um, Dennis, thank you so much for uh, participating today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could just say a little bit about some of your background as an entrepreneur, which I know has uh, been very active, and um, give us a little bit more context on your past experiences before X.AI, would be super helpful. Sure. If you want the uh, four-hour version, I'll give you the number to my mom. She can give you the really elaborate yes. uh, storyline of what was supposed to happen, what did happen, where we're at today. But just rewinding a little bit, given that I haven't done anything but startup. So I'm 23 years in. This is my fifth venture. I've done obviously four prior to this one. And if I just look at suddenly what my grand plan was when I took my CS degree back in the 90s, mm -hmm. it was actually one of not being an entrepreneur. As in, I was very clear in my mind that I'm going to get my CS degree, I'm going to take my bicycle, I'm going to go work for IBM, mm -hmm. specifically. That was my plan. Because my dad, my uncles, my cousins, they were all entrepreneurs in some way, shape, or form. And I've seen that picture <laughs> of working long hours, yeah, yeah. weekends, falling asleep in front of the telly. I just want to go work at IBM, get home at four, and be happy. It didn't uh, play out like was that. Was it in the genes? It was in the genes. It was in the water, perhaps. Uh -huh. And the funny story is that the catalyst was one for where I did game development to kind of fund my college time yeah. and get a little bit of extra money in my pocket. And that company went belly up three, four weeks before I was supposed to kind of graduate. And my plan was so perfect that I submit my project, I get some money, pay off whatever little debt I have. Remember, this is Denmark. Mm. And I take my bicycle out to IBM. It was like perfect, suddenly in my mind. And the funny thing, I haven't even called IBM. I just assumed I'll turn up at the front desk and say, so I'm ready, where's Work my desk? Out. And given they went belly up, I got just beyond disappointed, like just almost angry. And I'm super optimistic, just in general. And I ended up uh, getting in contact with my counsel and I bought the assets of that company back in the day for where people didn't really know what the value of software is. As in, I remember the lawyer wanted to kind of sell me chairs and tables and monitors and what have you. And all I wanted to buy was just two CDs with a little bit of software on it. So I did that. The company refinanced, figured out that I bought the primary asset and I made a small fortune in three <laughs> weeks. And I thought, you know what? With a little bit of money in my pocket, how about I take it all and invest into a internet data consulting company in the mid 90s, which was good timing. And for then sure. I lose it quickly and go work for IBM. Then we build up a awesome company. We did web server log analysis, ended up having a good exit in April of 2000. So I'm one of the kids that got out on the right side sure. of the dot-com boom. <laughs> yeah. Thereafter, I moved uh, to Budapest. We built another enterprise web analytics company. We sold that to Yahoo. We then ended up in New York. We built another predictive analytics company. We sold that to Outbrain. And then brought the team back together in late 2013 to set up X.AI, this idea of engineering an intelligent agent that could schedule my meetings. And now 
Been working on that for the last almost four and a half years. Going pretty well so far. I actually ran an accelerator outside of Charging Bull and Exit AI was uh, down to Fide, which I think we can see uh, from here. You can almost see your office from here, yes? Yeah, yeah, and you said you grew the team up to 90 people in that, in that space, is that so right? That's a funny story, right, for where, and I'm not on commission from WeWork <laughs> uh, at all, but we turned up at WeWork being around 10 people, kind of that, not even first inning, is right? That's how early it was, really? It was that early, wow. yes. And then grew it from about 10 to about 90 inside of WeWork. Just to kind of give you some idea of what is possible in some sort of shared office location. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's interesting because, uh, you know, in the same way that platforms that integrate work, productivity, education are changing, so are the settings that it takes place in. Getting another room or another desk, that should be very similar to just spinning up another instance on the AWS. And that's how I look at the WeWorks of the world, spinning up another instance. It's just a desk and two chairs. That is super interesting. And, and we're already picking up on a few, I think, entrepreneurial themes that, and characteristics that, that Dennis is, is demonstrating pretty clearly. You know, even from that moment of opportunity, coming out of school, the you know, targeted vision for your role, sort of changing uh, without, without notice, but then seeing an opportunity and being tenacious and just grabbing it. Not just to uh, regurgitate what you just said, yeah. that's my job, you said good things, I repeat them and I take the credit sure, for it. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> but I, I can't stress that enough, certainly in, in my mind, that whatever idea you have, good or bad doesn't matter, but whatever idea you have, you let on to it and you play it out in full. I'm not really, and that could be a uh, entrepreneurial defect. I think it's <laughs> a benefit or a value, but I'm not a fan of pivoting. I'm actually more a fan of saying, whatever idea you had, play it out to the nth degree, so much so that it might actually not work out, and that is okay. I actually think that is what we're supposed to do as startups, is to do things and play them out for where it didn't exist before and it didn't exist after because it wasn't supposed to exist and that's good because we can cross it off the list. That's such an interesting point and I think to the, to, to the point of this conversation around specifically how platforms like accelerators can enable the growth and scale of good and bad ideas, one of the things that you know in our experience that we've seen uh, work inside of accelerators and be effective for them for startups of multiple growth stages is that they accelerate progress and failure. And part of the point, and I think this is part of the comfort yeah. that you're talking about, is play it out to the nth degree, right? What are the uh, actions and resources that we need to explore this? Let's be ambitious and directed about how we m go in that direction. But once we get there, then be then look at the pivot. And it's, it's not that I'm not a fan of experimentation. I think a startup is really just one long set of experiments, one after another, for years on end. That's a startup. But if you and me agree to go invade Poland and we assemble a team and they're right behind us, halfway there, I can't kind of lean over and say, you know what, let's do Sweden instead. <laughs> what? As in, that's not what we set out to do. Mm -hmm. And if you and me team up to build a self-driving car, or if you and me team up to build this agent that can schedule meetings, that's what we set out to do. Now might not be the time, or we weren't able to assemble the right team, or raise the right capital, or get the right breakthroughs, and that's all okay. Sometimes, perhaps, we should try to figure out if we really feel it, so how do I get another $10, or how do I hire that guy, or how do I get the next customer? But that's all part of a set of experiments. We're still trying to go to the destination we talked about on day one. Yeah. We might have to zigzag a lot to kind of get there, but I'm not a fan of letting go of the destination. Let's at least agree on what the destination is yeah. and keep it the goal that we all have. Because the goal can't be survival at all costs. The goal should be one of getting to the destination for where dying along the way is acceptable. That is incredibly quotable uh, piece of wisdom there, wow. Um, and, and I think, you know, playing off of that, we're examining some of the key traits 
and behaviors that make entrepreneurs successful, or, or at least enable them to create opportunities for their own ideas and the people that they bring into their organizations. And I think one of the big question marks that we're looking at as we build the companies of the future and as we build platforms that can help fuel them from the perspective of learning, of getting resources, of uh, having a mission and a culture. So what do you look for when you have that conversation? Two answers. They might not answer it, and it might not be one of those questions where there's a distinct bullet in some list which we can point to, but two answers. One, we have obviously the usual kind of legalese, offer letter, employment contract, PIA, and all the things you need to kind of put in place to make sure that you can have an employment relationship with me and I pay you on time, and if I don't, then you can kind of point to those documents, yeah. like any other company, and that's fine, and we should. I actually don't care about them. As in, if you care about those, and you don't trust me enough to kind of pay you on time, we shouldn't be on this journey together. I will sign them, and I should, and that's fine, but you should immediately just sign them and put them away. What we then do is that we have this pledge. It's a half pager, really. Text that's censored, looks like a poem. And that is what I want you to sign up for. And I'll take one of the first statements in that, so which is that I'm looking for people who are comfortable in the dark. If you're signing up for some challenge for where I actually don't have the answer, I can see something which might look like a destination, but I need you to help me craft some of the answers, but you don't have the answer either. And that is where you somehow need to kind of figure out when is it so easy that the answer can be solved on the whiteboard in the interview itself. Say you and me set up a web consultancy for where we do web pages in raw HTML. Whatever question you have, we can do the answer on the whiteboard right now, as in, there are no unknown unknowns. If you then tell me, let's team up and do the self-driving car, let's team up and do the intelligent agent that can schedule meetings, there is nothing you can show me on the whiteboard that will be an answer to the challenges that we have. So you need to know that I'm gonna start here knowing that they don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, so we're in the dark, but we're gonna be comfortable there. Because these we can see a few steps ahead, and if we do them, they might shed some light on some other challenges. We'll do them, there'll be a little bit more light further out. And I blindly believe that if I do enough of that, then one day we'll walk out of this forest and it'll be glorious. So that whole document, and I picked one item from yeah, it, yeah. has a whole set of statements where we try to hire against that. That's, that's fascinating, I think, uh, from the- If it makes any sense, so I'm just rambling and say, Dennis, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. No, 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 it's, I mean, they, they, these are conversations that you know I have with, with founders and investors and, and, and even individuals and organizations at you know institutional levels that are trying to understand um, communicating and managing new employee relationships. And I think what was really interesting in that is the focus on trust not just as a way to understand if this is somebody who has the collaborative abilities to look at somebody else, have an entrepreneurial optimism, and be focused on creating great things together, but also as uh, an indication of their comfort in ambiguity, because you need yeah. to have that trust in order to, in order to operate in an yeah. ambiguous situation. And I think that's such a subtle point. And it is so easy just to kind of pick one of your words here to suggest that you are eager and willing to build trust within your team. You can almost not say anything that does not rhyme with that. You have to, right? Otherwise, you're just crazy. But what does it mean? What does that translate into? What tactics have you applied to build trust? Or what tactics do you think you need to put in place to build that trust? And then when you think about what it's going to take to grow the team, you know, what are the what are the challenges as far as, you know, finding employees that have these mindsets, developing the mindsets internally, but also what skills and technologies do you think there's a need for more fluency in as you build the company? Let me leave out the traditional tactics building any type of company for where most of the positions are known. So there's many things for where it could be super exciting for where the positions are known ahead of time. Yeah. It's really just a matter of how do I grow into it before I hire 
my CMO or my VP of sales or the next two senior SDRs. There's just a known set of positions that you're gonna hire for. What if you're in a space for where I'm not even sure I know the title of the individual I wanna hire. I'll give you a couple of examples certainly in our space. Sure. And this is true not just for what we do, but for many people who are trying to do something which is so new that suddenly education or even industry haven't yet arrived. Sure. So you and me get together over the weekend, trying to hack together some sort of app we figured out over two years later today. And we call up some of our friends we certainly need perhaps some guy who knows something about information architecture. We probably need some guy who knows something about user experience. We probably need a UI guy. And there's a set of positions where yes. even me just saying those acronyms, you immediately know who they are, mm -hmm. right? You're not confused. But what if you take our product for where the agent exists over email? There is no two pixels. There is no button. There is no drop down. No. <laughs> so who do you call? How do you do dialogue design? Who is that? What title? And that has been interesting. And I'll give you some other ones. So we ended up uh, baptizing it AI Interaction Designer. And Diane, who leads that down on 200 Broadway, is responsible for the dialogue. That means any words you see coming out of Amy or Andrew's mouth, our two AI agents, is something which she designed. And then once you say that's her job, what applications do we need to give her? So if you're a UI guy, I'll probably buy a license for Photoshop, right? What application do I buy for her? Can't be Word. It needs to be something else. So that is interesting. So that I find uh, almost kind of alluring. I'll give you another one here, which is any really machine learning based company in this day and age will survive on good data. What is good data? Good data certainly in 2018 might be one which is heavily labeled. Yeah. So how do you label that? Who defines that? Is that a data scientist? Who writes the manuals for how to label it? A data scientist probably doesn't do good manuals. Then who do you hire to actually sit and label it? What are they called? So those that sit and label it, we call them AI trainers. That's not a title you can look up in a book, but we can certainly see more and more people are starting to use it as in, Absolutely. you help me train the agent. So that is exciting. And there's a whole new process for having to lean into positions that didn't exist yesterday and have to kind of come up with them and then lure people in to something where- Exactly. How's that gonna look on my CV? This is a, a role in, uh, that requires a skill or at least yep. has a mandate that doesn't really exist yet or anywhere else. Uh, and that's what you're signing up for, and we expect you to know what, why that's an opportunity. And I think it needs to be loose enough for where they help craft it. And they have to believe in it so much that I will probably be one of the first ones with this title, but I blink, there'll be a thousand. I blink, there'll be 10,000 like me. But I'll be the one, I'll be the catalyst. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting, right? Because again, when you think about that process of saying, okay, here's the new need inside of the company for this technology, for developing the market or usership or whatever it is that we need to fill. Here's a, a person that might be, might have comfort with the darkness, that has uh, the trust that we need in order to be growing the organization with the right kind of talent. What is the process look like for pushing those two things together into something that has a new title and a new activity attached to it? suggest that people actively, even with all the uncertainty, try to put in place some career ladder. So even if we put in place a new position, we need to know what does the beginning of that position look like and what does the end look like? So if you start as a associate at some VC firm, there's a career path for how you end up being a partner sure. in 10, 15 years. If you start out as a junior programmer, there's probably a career path for how you can end up being the principal. That's interesting, yeah. But there needs to be a path because if you can't see it, it's almost unfair to put on the individual which you're trying to hire for them to kind of come up with it. So at least you should say, I, I think this could be a path. I think we have to kind of probably zigzag a little bit, but this is how I envision it for you. Yeah. So that is the one thing I would certainly suggest, which obviously exists 
for all other positions. If you hire any one of the positions I just mentioned and any other position in the organization, you can go download that on the internet in the next 10, 15 minutes. But for these people, you have to craft it. Yeah, and, and, and it's so important to have a, a structure, a process, and um, expectations around what that what that pathway can look like, right? And something that we're seeing develop, uh, you know, not just in startups, not just in corporations, but uh, everywhere is a way to maintain that kind of direction in one's career where there's coherence and yep. opportunity and that you can have a mission attached, uh, but at the same time, keep it responsive and agile to changes in the company, changes in the world. So. One of the great things, the uh, components of accelerators in all of their instances is the way that they bring together people that are building and operators that might be more experienced or have more access that can come in, mentor, and help understand how to continue responding in a difficult or ambiguous situation. Uh, does mentorship play a structured role in, in, from your perspective in, in, in how you can keep a, a workforce uh, responsive and uh, focused on uh, new opportunities? I certainly think so. So we've, and I shouldn't give us too much credit or being overly unique here, but we try to kind of separate what typically happens, certainly on the tech side, for where the, say, VP engineering will be the one that will end up doing the one-on-ones with the most kind of immediate team. And also at the same time, set the tech direction of the company. Mm -hmm. We're trying to kind of separate those two positions for where we have a CTO that will help set the tech direction of the company. And then we have people tech managers. Their job is to grow the human being. And the CTO's job is to grow the technology, but they're separate tasks. Sometimes they get married, not just in tech, but in many verticals for where perhaps VP sales should grow revenue. And then there's somebody else who should grow the individuals on the team. But somehow in any hierarchy, it ends up being kind of mushed together. Mm. If you could separate them, then there's just this individual where your job is to grow Susan. Your success is measured on how successful Susan is, not on kind of revenue outcome or co push to production, whatever kind of vertical you might be in. And we've certainly seen some success. I'm not saying that we've uh, kind of nailed it. We continue to optimize, but I like the idea of having separated those two at least. Sure. If that makes any sense. Of course, of course, yeah. I mean, I think having some sort of structure around not just what mentor, the activity of mentorship, yeah. but the focus of it, and splitting that into its own role, I mean, is unique and, and very interesting. So, um, you know, again, when, when you think about uh, how developing the company, developing the technology, uh, understanding where there are opportunities to grow, is there a system behind how uh, the company finds those new directions or ideas? So we've tried multiple things. Uh, including group goal setting, such as I tell you what we want to achieve as a company, mm. some really high level metric. Could be revenue, could be some usage number, but really high level. Then the team sets the goals, as in, why would I know? You tell me how we should achieve that. That was a little bit too chaotic, mm -hmm. as in too many kind of mental steps to make of, I'm an engineer, how, I can't connect this feature with this very high level goal. So what we've done is kind of make a more perhaps timid version of mm -hmm. that, which is that we do quarterly goals, but then for each of the kind of verticals within the company, and we come up with the metrics for how to measure success on whether we achieve that goal. Mm. And then we allow them to say, hey, if I want to kind of increase the amount of meetings which our customers do using Amy, or whether I want to increase yeah. the guest rating and their experience of being on the guest end, now it's the team to kind of figure out, so uh, how do we do that? And they then go craft projects and then the individual teams 
given that you have more projects than you have resources, try to figure out amongst them why is one better than the other? Mm. What is the reason for I think there's a more or a higher likelihood of this one succeeding over that one? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you have to kind of figure out exactly how democratized you can make it and how much of an anarchy it can turn into if sure, you have too sure. much of a delta here. Yeah, and, and I think that's another interesting pattern that we're sort of seeing in the, and how the mindset, uh, the entrepreneurial mindset here sort of translates to structures in the company, right? Yep. Because this is another instance of how there is a radical transparency, where this is the agreed upon goal. And not just are we gonna, are we gonna share that with everybody, or does everybody have the ability to see what that is, but we're gonna collaborate on what it means to achieve it. Yep. What are the skills that I, you think there's there's the most need for in a company, you know, like X.AI that that is so emergent, that is so innovative, uh, and, and and how do you respond to that uh, in building the company? There's certainly a pool of skills for where if you hire experts, you should figure out exactly what an expert look like in that vertical, and if you hire some unique data scientist, which is supposed to come here, work on some unique NLP problem. Mm. There's a set of things which we'd like them to know as they walk in the door. Sure. And plenty of those things can be tested for. And what I certainly like, whether that be for engineering or sales or marketing or customer success, is knowing how to test for it. Because it is very easy and help, you and me have done this when we were younger, to bring people in for a chit chat. Mm -hmm. It's not an interview, it's just you and me chit-chatting, and you seem kind of nice, perhaps you should come work here. And you haven't really tested for anything. And it's exactly. so easy to do that. And I think you need to know exactly what am I testing for, so that you can ask questions and score it, so that when they walk out, you can see, how did they score? It might be a flawed test, then you can work on your test and make it better over time. But you need to have it be a testing mechanism. It doesn't have to be something where you need to solve these puzzles on the whiteboard. That's not what I'm talking about. It could just be things through this conversation for where I want to figure out your level of empathy. Okay, how do I score it? What questions do I ask uh, to figure out whether you are empathetic? Mm -hmm. If that's something I think is super important for the values that we have. You can't just say that and have a chit chat and then walk out and say, you seem kind of empathetic. How? As in, and how do I compare you to a friend over there? Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Yeah. Now, that is the testable part. The one thing I certainly, and I'm sure, you know, Meredith, who runs the people function on our end, will have a laugh, but mm -hmm. I still, in this day and age, and perhaps I'm just too much of an entrepreneur, fall back into the idea of hiring people who are entrepreneurial. We can then talk about, okay, I hear you, I think it's important, especially in the early days, because everything we do comes with a level of uncertainty, and people who are entrepreneurial in their mindset just cope with that better. How do you then test for that, and what are the type of questions that you ask? When I do the interviewing, which I do for the executive team, um, I might lean on the entrepreneurial part a little bit too much, <laughs> calling myself out here, uh, but I find that, certainly in my heart, extremely important. And if I look back, I'm 23 years in on my fifth venture where it didn't pan out as I had hoped for. I think it's many times because if you ask people, do you want to do startup? Yeah. No, you don't. You, you want to say yeah because you're supposed to say yes, uh, right? Yeah. It's like. Do you want to be a rock star? Yeah, absolutely. Do you play the guitar? No. So uh, I guess that's the end of your career here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I can somehow tease that out, that certainly provides me some comfort. Yeah. But I'm now completely aware of the fact that I have a blind spot for something which I care about. Sure, sure. I, I mean, again here, right? The answer to this question could have been data science, right? There's there's not enough skills or there's not enough uh, you know, people that have this skill. It could have been, you know, blockchain. We, we, we want to start pivoting our technology yeah. around this. The, the, the response here is, is, is about the process, right? And, yep. and, and targeting the traits and the behaviors that actually position somebody to build whatever skills those are as they become necessary in the company. 
And I think that that's just a wonderful sentiment for us to, to close the conversation on here. So, so Dennis, thank you so much for the time and the thoughts here today for sharing so candidly and transparently about how you're building a, an amazing company. Um, is there anything that you'd like for the audience to keep in mind about X.AI uh, uh, moving forward? So here's the thing. What you should do right now is go to X.AI. That's the domain. Having obviously read about AI in the paper for the last 12 months, not really having touched it, go sign up. There's a free trial and start using Amy or Andrew as an agent because that will get you a real tangible relationship with AI and where we're at in June 2018. Then we'll be friends. You can find me anywhere on the internet and say, Dennis, what the hell? And I'll help you out. Check it out. Let the company know that you've done that. Uh, this is Accelerating Future, the podcast about how about the future of organizations, platforms for innovation and acceleration in the new economy. Accelerating Future podcast is a co-production of Smart Professions and the Studio Project. Smart Professions is a career accelerator that helps upskill individuals into new kinds of work. The Studio Project builds accelerators as a service and has worked with tech accelerators and startup accelerators in New York, as well as the World Bank, Verizon, and other institutions. Thank you all for watching. <laughs>